Mental health is as important as physical health. And just like physical illnesses, mental health issues affects a person's overall functioning. Together, let us learn about stress, addiction, anxiety, and a lot more here in the Health Emphasis Week. Join our health lecturers as they give us healthy information that we really need for this time. Welcome again to our series of lectures on our Health Emphasis Week with the focus of mental health. So before we'll start, I'd like to invite everyone to please pray with me before we'll proceed. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray for your 
wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding. We pray for your Holy Spirit, Lord God, to fill us, Lord God, and we pray that may you create in us a clean heart and renew right spirit within us. Help us to be receptive of your message tonight and speak to us in your own special way, Lord. Thank you so much for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So tonight, we will be discussing about depression. Specifically, depression among adolescents. The World Health Organization identifies adolescents as individuals belonging to age group of 10 to 19 years old, while youth as 15 to 24 years old. As a total, the young people covers 10 to 24 years old. We see that adolescence is a very unique and formative time. It is a crucial period for developing and maintaining social and emotional habits important for the mental well-being. Thus, promoting psychological well-being and protecting well-being is very important for the youth. With that, I just want to ask you, have you ever encountered one who is ever complaining about having physical symptoms like sick and run down, or they have difficulty sleeping, they have poor appetite, they always complain of muscle pains, they have a rapid weight loss and they're always tired, or even manifesting behaviors such as before they were so very active and outgoing, but now they, they just start to withdraw from others or they doesn't get things done at all, or they stop doing enjoyable activities, they have difficulty concentrating, and they have increased alcohol consumption. Or at times, they may have expression of thoughts like, nothing good ever happens to me, life is not worth living, um, my future looks bleak, or I'm worthless, it's my fault, I'm a failure, or, they may even share feelings like, I'm so very overwhelmed, I'm unhappy, they are irritable, they are frustrated, they lack confidence, or many times they become very indecisive. Have you ever encountered one? Mental health accounts for 16% of the global burden of disease and injury among people aged 10 to 19 years old. And globally, according to the World Health Organization, depression is the fourth leading cause of illness and disability among adolescents. Therefore, the consequences of not addressing this adolescent mental health condition may extend to adulthood, thus limiting the opportunities of these adolescents to live a fulfilling adult life. So the objectives of this lecture are to know the symptoms of depression in adolescents, to understand that suicide is a public health problem, to identify ways to protect yourself and others from suicide, to identify suicide risk factors, to know the red light warning signs for suicide risk, and how to manage depression. Now, what is depression? I think it is very important to distinguish that being sad is not the same as having depression. Everyone feels sad or lonely sometimes, but these feelings usually pass with a little time. However, when we say depression, it is a pervasive and relentless sense of despair. Depression is not just sadness. In fact, it is a diagnosable illness with a specific symptoms. Some of the common symptoms are lack of interest in life accompanied by weight loss, loss of appetite, feelings of uselessness or worthlessness, and sometimes sleep disturbances. And in order for one to be diagnosed with depression, the individual must have symptoms present most of the day for at least two weeks. Teenagers, especially young teens, may exhibit several symptoms of depression and yet be unaware that they are suffering from depression. Unfortunately, children and adults and sometimes don't have the language to label their emotions. 
they may have been depressed for so long yet they don't know that what they're experiencing is already depression they don't understand that it's possible to feel differently about four percent of teenagers have major depressive disorder at any one time among teens girls are more often affected than boys and the major depressive disorder frequently interferes with home, school, and family life, which may also cause family stress. And you know what? The most serious risk of untreated depression is the potential for suicide. In fact, suicide is the third leading cause of death among teenagers with about half of this associated with depression. So teens who are depressed often have negative view of themselves, not just about themselves, but also about the world and about their future. They may appear for look out on the signs of rejection and even criticisms. And they appear to overreact on situations that aren't necessarily negative. Like they may be extremely sensitive to rejection or failure. They may have low self-esteem and feelings of guilt. They may have frequent complaints of illnesses such as headaches and stomach aches. And also, they may be noticed to have frequent absences from school or they have poor performance in school. They may have threats or attempts to run away from home. And even major changes is very evident in their eating habits or sleeping patterns. While many people think of depression as a pervasive feeling of sadness, like being sad or being blue as most of us can notice, in teens, it often shows up as increased irritability. They may also show depression by dropping out in activities that they once find very enjoyable and then suddenly they may complain that nothing is fun anymore. So. Usually these teens, they will continue to do those activities with the uh, attempt to have or to gain fun from those activities. However, when they try to do it, they will then realize that it's no longer fun anymore. They don't find any happiness on it anymore. So they may also have trouble sleeping, low energy, they have poor appetite and trouble concentrating or at times they become socially withdrawn or they perform poorly in school. So these teens, they, they may sometimes stop calling their friends or on the other way around, they stop receiving calls from their friends. They just, they just want detachment from the world. And at its worst, they can be suicidal. For the younger teens, they may not actively threaten to kill themselves, however, they may have statements saying they wish they were dead or they wish they had never been born. Um, according to the World Health Organization, the National Center for Mental Health has revealed a significant increase in monthly hotline calls regarding depression, with numbers rising from 80 calls pre-lockdown to nearly 400. And the most vulnerable population are those in ages 15 to 29 years old. So you see, emotional disorders like depression can have a profound effect in the areas of our life, especially for teens, um, their school attendance or their school performances. And being socially withdrawn, it can exacerbate isolation and loneliness. And like what I've said, at its worst, depression can lead to suicide. Um, a study by Hoberman and Garfinkel about suicidal ideation, 62% had made a suicidal statement. 45% had consumed alcohol within 12 hours of killing themselves, and 76% had shown a decline in academic performance in the past year. So projected before you, this is according to the worldview of the World Health Organization that an estimated 62,000 adolescents died in 2016 as a result of self-harm. Suicide accounts for an estimated 6% of all deaths among young people. And 
Suicide is the second leading cause of death among females and third among males aged 10 to 24 years old. It is important to know that though many people will say that it is a myth for those people who attempted suicide and did not complete it are just doing it for attention, it appears that people who eventually completed their suicide had multiple prior attempts. In fact, for adults, they may have attempted 25 times prior, prior to succeeding the suicide. And for teens, they may have 100 to 200 prior attempts. And with this, females are about twice as likely as males to report seriously considering suicide attempting suicide and requiring medical attention. However, males are far more likely to succeed in committing suicide. According to the recent Global School-Based Student Health Survey in the Philippines, 11.6% of Filipino adolescents aged 13 to 17 years old considered attempting suicide while 16.8% attempted suicide at least one in the past year. If you notice, 11.6% and 16.8% is already a big figure for those adolescents attempting suicide and who attempted suicide. Noteworthy for all of us is that once suicidal behavior occurs, it may sensitize adolescents to future suicide-related thoughts and behaviors. And then, suicidal behavior makes the suicidal cognitive schema easily available in the future stressful situations. Suicide rates are also high amongst vulnerable groups who experience discrimination. According to the study made by the Journal of American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, gay and lesbian youths show a two to seven fold increase in suicidal ideation and behavior. They were also found to be more likely to make attempts that would require medical attention. They were more likely to have been bullied and victimized at school. Another study made by Gold, it shows that substance abuse or substance use may be a factor in escalating suicidal ideation into suicide attempts. Alcoholics have a suicide rate 50 times higher than the general population. Alcohol-dependent persons make up 25% of all suicides and 18% of alcoholics eventually completed suicide. It has even showed that for those states who are who have restrictive policies toward alcohol, they have the lowest suicide rate. So if you can see, there is really a correlation between the alcohol and the suicide rates, according to that study made by Lester. So depression. What to do if you think a child is suicidal? According to the Mental Health America, they have suggested five steps. First is to talk to the child. Even the World Health Organization, they have encouraged that for those depressed adolescents, the first step to do is to talk to them. Ask the child or teen if they feel depressed or thinks about suicide or death. I think it is important to remember that one should not hesitate or should not be afraid to ask the child or the adolescent if they have any suicidal ideations. Speaking honestly and openly allows a child to confide in you and gives you a chance to express your concern. Listen to his or her thoughts and feelings in a caring and respectful manner. Again, talk and listen carefully and honestly. Be genuine. The second is help. Let the child or teen know that you care and want to help them. By this, they, it will enable them to feel that they are not alone and that they are heard. The third is supply the child or teen with local resources. So such as a crisis hotline or the location of a mental health clinic. 
If the teen or the child is a student, find out if there are any available mental health professionals at the school and let the child know about them. And then, refer. Never ever hesitate to seek professional help. Remember, depression is not just something but it is a public health problem it is essential to seek expert advice from a mental health professional that experience helping depressed children and teens after you have referred inform alert key adults in the child's life like the family friends and teachers inform the child's parents or primary caregiver and recommend that they seek professional assistance for their child or teen. So again, first is talk to the child. Second, help, offer help. The third is give them resources, supply the teen's resources. And then the fourth is refer and seek professional help. And lastly, never ever to forget inform or alert the key adults in the child's life. Now we also have this what we call self-injury versus suicide. When we say self-injury, it is an attempt to alter one's mood by inflicting physical harm on oneself. It could be uh, through carving, burning, um, scratching, branding, or hitting. So what happens is that they don't have any plan to kill themselves but they just want to have an escape from their current situation through self-injury so there in, there appears to be an increase in the number of teens who are using self-injury to cope with negative emotions some teens would report that they already feel numb so that's why they try to harm or they try to injure themselves to know if they can still feel pain or others would report using self-injury to see if they could stand the pain if they did try to kill themselves i think it is important that all teens whom you have noticed to have self-injured be evaluated by a mental health professional teens who pierce and tattoo do not fall into this category despite what some of us might think of those practices so in suicide prevention we also have these three lights just like in a traffic lights we have the green yellow and red lights in suicide we suicide prevention we also have the green light the yellow light and the red light so let's start with the green light um, the green light would say good to go these are protection against suicide many of us would ask what could be done to prevent our loved ones from becoming suicidal so the green light would show protective factors that would make it less likely that someone become suicidal first getting help for mental physical and substance abuse disorders especially depression uh, restricted access to highly lethal methods of suicide especially firearms an established relationship with a doctor clergy teacher, counselor, or other professional who can help, and then connectedness to community, family, or friends. Support system is very important for each one of us. And then learn skills in problem solving and non-violent conflict resolution. And lastly, one of the factors that could protect against suicide is cultural or religious beliefs that discourages suicide. So we're done with the green light, which is good to go. Then let's go to the yellow light or the suicide risk factors. So there are several risk factors that would put one high risk for suicide. The yellow light commonly means that we proceed with caution. It emphasizes that these risk factors may, once you see these risk factors, we need to handle them with caution. So example are mental disorders, substance abuse disorders, family history of suicide, hopelessness, impulsive or aggressive tendencies, 
barriers to accessing mental health treatment, divorce parents or poor family communication, relational, social, work or financial loss, physical illness, previous suicide act, easy access to lethal methods, especially guns, age, culture, lack of connectedness, exposure to sensational media reports of suicide. So these are just a few of the risk factors that can put one high risk for suicide. It is important to remember that a single risk factor will not immediately put you high risk for suicide. However, risk factors together should signal a concern. Um, the presence of depression, bipolar disorder, hopelessness, substance abuse, in combination with other risk factors increase significantly. Now let's go to the red light. Red light means suicide warning signs. So when you see these warning signs, you should stop and then get help. Warning signs go beyond risk. They are usually evident with what people say or do. Like when you notice them talking, uh, reading or writing about suicide or death, talking about feeling worthless or helpless, saying, I'm going to kill myself, I wish I was dead, or I shouldn't have been born. Or you may even have seen those people visiting or calling people to say goodbye, giving things away or returning borrowed items suddenly, self-destructive or reckless behavior, significant change in behavior or running away so when a child has more than one of these factors the risk of suicide is increased and when you see them as warning signs you need to stop and get help then we also have this hopelessness hopelessness is a component of depression and a risk factor for suicide people who experience hopelessness they are the ones who believe that there is no chance of improvement in their future or from their current situation and that they may have reasons why their problems cannot get better in the future or that life will continue to be worse or even unbearably painful. So children and teens may have poor coping skills or problem-solving skills which add to their feelings of hopelessness. So these are the typical hopeless statements like, there's no point in going on. I can't take it anymore. I have nothing left to live for. I can't stop the pain. Or they may even say, I can't live without my boyfriend or I can't live without that person. Or they may say, my life keeps getting worse and worse. No matter what I do, it's, it just couldn't get better. Or they may say, I might as well kill myself. So people who are suicidal often talk about these feelings. If you can see, there is a theme of psychological pain and intense hopelessness in this statement. With regards to depression among adolescents, why should schools be involved? So children come into contact with more potential rescuers in the schools than in the community. Children's problems are often more apparent in the school than in the home. And children from divorced or dysfunctional families are less likely to get help at home. As we've noted before, 76% of teens who kill themselves show a decline in school performance in the previous year. I think I have mentioned it many times that one of the manifestations of adolescent depression is that poor school performance. Now, if there is any sudden or dramatic change from the performance of the child at school, it should be taken seriously, such as an overall decline in grades, there is a decrease in effort or misconduct in the classroom, 
unexplained or repeated absence or truancy. So these are the, you usually notice them to those children that before they were very good at school. They even have excellent performance. However, just uh, out of nowhere, they just suddenly had an overall decline in their grades. They don't have any um, joy in going to school anymore. So they have unexplained or repeated absence, absences and then they have decreased effort with their school activities. So who should intervene? In times like this, this is a crisis. Now, who should intervene? Not everyone who works with teenagers should work with a suicidal teenager. Know your limitations. We all have limitations. And I think there is nothing wrong when we honestly say that this is not my expertise or I, this is not your field. That's why if you have seen that limitations to you, you should not hesitate to get help from someone. So as projected before you, get someone else to help if you are a recent suicide survivor, are experiencing suicidal thoughts yourself, are experiencing significant stress in your own life, or if you have negative personal feelings about the teen. So you can ask someone or you can get someone else for help. However, despite these limitations that we have, that doesn't mean we cannot do anything at all. Important thing to remember is that you should not leave the child alone until the help arrives. If you have done that, then you have saved a life. This information comes from the National Education Association where it says, what do educators need to know? The educators need to know that there is no confidentiality when a child is talking about suicide. And when you have already become suspicious or that you have noticed already that the child is already manifesting symptoms of suicide or depression, act immediately. Do not wait until class is over or until the end of the day. Take action even if you are not sure. It is important for times like this to let the student know that the adults in the school are concerned of their welfare also because the students who are manifesting this depression or suicidal thoughts, they may misinterpret it that uh, uncertainty or failure to act immediately is a form of not caring for them or they, you have no, you do not think about them. So in this time, what action should be done? Immediately, contact the school counselor, social worker, or school administrator. The school counselor, social worker, or school administrator will then contact the student's parents or guardian, and then keep the student under supervision at all times until someone else takes over. Keep the child on your side at all times until someone else takes over. In times of crisis, so what can you say? Because having this, this adolescent in front of you, we tend to panic, right? We, we tend to become shaky of what can we say? How do we comfort this child? What not to say? So here's a, here are some of those comforting words that we can say. Um, you can say, I'm glad you told me I want to help. Or I'm glad you told me and I am going to find someone else to help you. Or you will say, I will stay with you until help arrives. How we communicate with this teen is very important as it will convey to them our sincerity and our genuineness to help them with their crisis. There is help conveyed even with just the way we communicate to them during this time. 
of course, if there are things that we can say, there are also things that we must not say. Because instead of saying them, we can even put more on their feelings. So these are the phrases that are not helpful to someone who is feeling intense pain and maybe suffering from depression. Like, it's just a face. So they were already pouring out their hearts to you and then you will just say, you will just tap them on their shoulder and just say, it's just a face. So, or you will just say, stop being selfish. You are so selfish. You keep on thinking about yourself. Or you will tell them, come on, you're just trying to get attention. Get over it. Or you will just tell them, it's okay, it's normal because you're a teenager, you will undergo those kind of things. So it's okay, it's normal. Do not say those words. We must be sensitive in acknowledging what they are feeling. The impact of the enormity of the challenges, the trials or the crisis that each one of us experiences is very subjective according to the threshold we can cater in our life. What seems little to you may be a wave already for that person. Or what seems so small to you may already be a giant for that person. So we should always be sensitive in acknowledging what they are feeling. Now, these are just few of the steps how to manage depression. If you have remember in the Sunday's lesson, it has been discussed the biopsychological approach. We, with this kind of approach, we acknowledge the interconnectedness of emotional, social, biological, and psychological factors. So, first step in managing depression is positive self-talk. It's okay to do positive self-talk. And then express your feelings. And then connect with your friends. Especially at this time of lockdown that we are being separated because of social distances. However, that won't limit us from connecting with our friends. We still have the internet. We can still connect with them through the social media or the telephones. So, you can still connect with them, share to them, and then talk with them. And also, take care of your health. That's why you need to get have enough sleep and then exercise. Do exercise. And then learn how to forgive. Find that inner peace with God by talking to God, praying to God, and seeking Him. Nothing can surpass the power that God can do to your current situation. He's as close as your next breath. So do not hesitate to pour out your heart to God. You are never alone and there are no prayers of yours that remain unnoticed by Him. Always remember that there is no hopeless case in the Lord. The God who made the lame to walk again, the God who made the blind to see, the God who made the race, who raised the dead to life, the God who made the Red Sea separated into two is an able God. And He is a God whose hands are not too short to save you, nor a God whose ears are not too dull to hear you. Just go to Him and pray to God about all the things that you have in your heart. There, for the next slide, I'll be sharing to you some of the Bible promises that God wants us to keep in our heart as we have this kind of challenges. So, Philippians 4.8, it says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Deuteronomy 31.8 
The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Psalms 41.3 I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in Him. Psalms 41.3 And lastly, when you feel so tired already that you think you can't go on anymore, when you think that nobody else listens to you and you've got no one else to share what you're undergoing through, do not hesitate to go to God. For he said, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Thank you so much for being with us. And before we'll end this, I want to invite all of you to have a word of prayer with me. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for the blessing of guidance that you have been with us, Lord God, and for the message that you have spoken to each one of us, Lord. We pray, Lord, that may you inculcate them in our hearts and in our minds. Remind us of all your promises and all the things that you have taught us. Every time we will be crossing or we will be taking steps into this dark tunnel of our lives, Lord God, help us to always look back from the last time we saw the light and remember that he who is with us will always be with us until Jesus comes. Thank you so much for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So once again, thank you so much for listening. I'm inviting you again to please be with us tomorrow for another health lecture episode. Thank you so much.